I'll move on to the story that I have for today, uh, which is what we're seeing with Disney and the streaming service that they ro- operate, uh, deciding that they're going to purge dozens of series from the platform, from Hulu. Uh, these, this is content that people, human beings worked on, artists worked on. Maybe it doesn't speak to you. Maybe it isn't the most compelling as any of the artwork or any of the productions that I just uh, hyped. But, you know, it doesn't matter. It could be Mr. Waffles goes to the moon. It could be some, uh, you know, whimsical, goofy story. Uh, Lots of it is for children. No matter what you think of the individual titles, there were people who worked hard in order to produce this and to see that um, a multi billion dollar corporation that rakes in so much money is just going to remove it so people don't have any access to it anymore is well we're going to get to what it is because there have been some really visceral reactions from the writers who right now are on strike so i think we connect the two stories it's pretty audacious for disney to push forward with this it shows um uh, what they believe they can get away with Uh, because the Writers Guild strike is in its third week and they're going forward and taking down all of this content um, and and fueling what is this new way of managing artists. And I think it presents a kind of dark future for the way we consume entertainment. And so uh, if you... We go back here. Uh, I've got this deadline article that has been circulated widely, that has spotlighted the kind of shows. uh, The Willow, which was a TV series that picked up after this cult film from Lucasfilm in 1980s. Uh, That's one that has really caught people's attention. This was a darling of Warwick Davis and all kinds of other people to bring it back. It got canceled before they could do another season and bring back Val Kilmer's character, although he's been struggling. um, And I don't know if his health and, you know, what he has to deal with now would have lent itself to a cameo, but they were certainly going to try similar to how they brought him back for the Top Gun sequel. But you have things like Big Shot, Turner, Turner and Hooch. Mighty Ducks, again, was this kind of like nostalgic, uh, going back to uh, the film with Emilio Estevez. And then you've got these other things. There. And this, I'm surprised to see that the world, according to Jeff Goldblum, is being yanked. Um, and you've got Little Demon being yanked. You've got all these shows uh, and... They'll claim that they're short-lived series, they're specials or direct-to-streaming movies that didn't do very well. Um, but what's important is that there were artists involved with these. And, and you see in this article from Deadline, an agent describing what it means to have exposure on these streaming services, what streaming was supposed to represent, where even if you weren't getting paid well and you didn't have a lot of money that was coming in from residuals, you at least had this exposure that somebody could stumble upon this. When I opened any of these streaming services at the end of my long day, working on an article, working on putting together a news report, when I kick back and spend a couple hours unwinding, I have an opportunity to maybe find this person's work. I don't know. I'm probably not going to watch the kids shows that some of these people worked on, but over on HBO max, I might find something new on Hulu. I might some find something new and I can't do that. If the, I can't really find something that might be fresh and different that nobody's really talking about. If Disney and uh, uh, HBO max or Warner media or whatever is going to remove these, before we get to find these kind of, I guess you call them the diamonds in the rough or something that speaks to you, that they have like idiosyncrasies that make you 
happy. Now, other people aren't watching it, but you know, you find something in it that is entertaining to you. And you can't do that anymore, I suppose, because I guess the stakes are so high now, or the way that these uh, capitalistic, greedy enterprises are going to behave is that you can't just list these on a streaming service anymore. So it's even further away from what it was like to go to a video store and go through the selections and pick out what you wanted. And so the deadline um, in this uh, article that I encourage you to go read the streaming purge if you're interested in what's going on in the industry. Uh, there was a wave of library content removals that have been ongoing in the past year. A couple of writers worked on this. You can find this at Deadline. So who decides which shows are getting the boot, they asked. Well, it's Bean Counters, mostly who consider the cost of carrying library content based on how much is paid toward residuals, participations, and royalties. That is weighed against viewership and a title's ability to lure more subscribers. So again, like the writers, the producers, the directors, the actors, the people who are involved in these projects don't matter. And it's all about money, money, money and underperforming and sometimes not even given a chance to perform. You know, what we're going to see here is that when we're talking about Willow, that's a six month old show. And they're deciding after that short amount of time that it's a failed show and it should be removed from the platform. John Bickerstaff is saying he's a writer and he's on strike. And he said of Willow, cause he was a writer on that show. They gave us six months, not even the business has become absolutely cruel. And before you say tax write-offs, because that's something that has been said about how this entire process works. Before you say tax write-offs, he says, you should know that these shows have already been released and they can't be written off. And in the case of Willow, they own the property outright. The only conclusion that this is to get out of paying residuals during a strike. So they don't want to pay writers and they're removing these shows and the excuses that they're not performing well. And in a public that doesn't know how the business works, they're relying on our ignorance. And they're also relying on the fact that maybe we didn't watch the show, we don't care about the show. So they're gonna be able to remove it without us getting angry. And then John adds, and look, internal streaming libraries are not sustainable. We're all going to have to adjust to that at some point, but to spend, and he doesn't say how much was spent on a show and then disappear it six months later is just bad business. I don't know if maybe he's not allowed contractually to say how much was spent, but it really doesn't matter. You make up your dollar figure and then they just yank it. I mean, what, it, what, what are we doing here? This it really doesn't make sense. It's pretty senseless. It's important. These, these reactions I've collected here, they're coming from writers that are impacted. My first episode of TV is being wiped from the streamer after only six months and, and, and Brittany Jang says this blows. They worked on Big Shot. Uh, I believe that's the show with John Stamos. Before there were DVD box sets to have as a keepsake. Now it will be as if it never existed. Um, here's another one I'll pull up here for you. I find these to be outrageous. I find what they're doing to be rather infuriating and i'm not even someone who created a show for these platforms i wrote on both seasons of the mysterious benedict society some of my proudest work this is an emmy nominated screenwriter um i believe his name is james and or uh and he, my nephews just became the right age to really enjoy it my sister a teacher shows episodes to her students as long as it's streamable i get paid but now it will be gone forever. Again, this is all just about not paying people. So what I can get into here is a little bit further explanation that comes from Benjamin uh, Simon, who is, or Seaman, he's a TV writer. Um, he's worked on uh, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, um, and he gets into this. Studios remove series from streaming to avoid paying writers and actors insanely tiny amounts of residuals. It's why writers and actors 
have to strike so we can afford to make any kind of living supplying the stories and talent that makes studios billions. Um, so uh, just quickly, I'll, I'll run through these without putting them on the screen. There's Eliza Clark here who says, well, you work on something for years, pour your heart out and soul into it as do hundreds of other artists. You make it during a global pandemic far from home. Then it is canceled before it even has a chance to finish airing. And then it is disappeared. Um, and it's as if it never happened. It's as if nobody ever worked on the show at all. And how do you tell people what you did? How do you tell people what you were working on? And how do you get future work if you can't point to where it is? And if it's no longer on the platform, maybe that looks like you're the reason why or you're responsible. Who's going to take a risk on you and give you another show? And how do you get future paid work if the past work has been pulled from the platform? I would think I could see studio executives treating that as like a demerit against you that like there's something negative about you that that has happened. And so this is, this is, this is awful. And I think it points to why we still have to hold on to the physical if we can, but I don't know how that's possible. What's been pointed out is these shows being removed, all these streaming services that are purging because of these executives that have taken over these greedy billionaire executives that are just concerned about squeezing the most maximum amount of profits and also turning the screws on writers and other people and, and not paying them more as they are on strike is that you can't go anywhere and get these. There's no physical copies to buy of these shows. And so while you used to maybe in the past, there would have been some way that the studios could control distribution of these shows, uh, could stop syndicating it. There was at least the possibility that maybe you would have a DVD or you could have a VHS copy of this and you could watch it when you wanted to. And that would still mean that your work was in circulation to some degree. You could find it. You might be able to go find it at a thrift store, other places like that could be sold at auctions. Um, it could be, maybe you'd find it on eBay. Who knows? There's stores that sell these, but how are you supposed to ever get people to see this when it's under lock and key? Your know, Disney's going to take this content and they're not going to make it available to anyone. And how do you pirate? Well, so now you say, well, maybe the pirates will save these writers. Maybe the fact that Disney is going to try to pull, put this away. There's going to be people who go and make it available for illegal downloads. Well, I don't know if you could get away with that. Uh, the technology is so far advanced that they might be able to stop it from being shared. And I don't know, does anybody want to take the risk of being in trouble for internet piracy? Uh, we're 10, 15, 20 years beyond what it was like when Napster first came on the scene and uh, people were first dealing with the phenomenon of internet piracy. So I don't know if that can be some kind of saving grace for writers, even though that's not what they would want because they would want people to legitimately access and watch their content. But this happens amidst a writer's strike. And I believe no matter what you perceive as far as the politics of the people who work in this, you have to have working class solidarity with those who are working in these spaces. Um, endorsing them does not necessarily mean that you endorse the projects that they work on. And uh, and I, I would say that you've watched something in the past year or two that was done by somebody in the Writers Guild. And if it gave you relief, if it gave you a break from the slogs, the grind of life, then you owe it to support what the writers are doing. So I'll conclude um, this with, I want to show uh, James Mangold, who is the director of the, for uh, the up and coming Indiana Jones dial of destiny. And he was at the con film festival and he was asked uh, during the press conference about the writer's strike. I think it was a vaguely worded question. He wasn't quite sure what he was expected to say 
about the strike, but he did say some kind words of solidarity for writers. He is a writer. He worked on this film. You know, no movie happens without a great script and no great script happens without writers. And, um, and, and writers are often, um, because they're first in the process, they're often also first to be forgotten. Um, and, and I think that is true in so many parts of the business. So I support them in their struggle to get what, what could be fair for everybody. So thank you. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, if you are still around, uh, if you're watching this video after it's been archived, after we streamed, or if you're here right now, make sure you're subscribed. Maybe join the channel. There's going to be uh, member-only content here. I'm going to start doing more of these segments at the channel, along with the content that we do on the issues that I tend to cover. And I don't need to go down that list. If you're here at this channel, you're probably familiar with what I do. But thank you. And uh, we'll be back next week with another segment. And this will be what we do. We'll go through some upcoming releases, maybe something that's just opened in theaters. Uh, and then we'll talk about a big movie story from the past week. So it was good doing this with you. And uh, we'll be back next week.